today on a very special edition of Flashpoints. We broadcast live from the Sebastopol Community Center located in the heart of wine country where the battle for immigrant worker rights is on the forefront of the new civil rights movement. My name is Dennis Bernstein. I'm here with Miguel Gavilan Molina. We're in Sebastopol. This is farm worker country. This exquisite music you hear in the background is the professor, Dr. Loco, uh, playing with Francisco Molina, the brother of our good friend and brother and roving producer, Miguel Gavilan Molina. Uh, we are broadcasting this special benefit uh, featuring Dr. Loco and in honor of 10 years. Ten incredible years on the part of the Great and Day Labor Center fighting on the forefront for worker rights, for migrant rights. Let's start with uh, with you, uh, uh, Ron Lopez Sr. You are, uh, I mean, I don't want to give away your age because we're still young men here together. Uh, but you are, in a way, sort of first generation of teaching of revolutionary groundbreaking teaching of ethnic studies and Mexican American studies, Chicano studies why um, why was this so important? What got you started? Where did this come from? Because it certainly didn't precede you No, it didn't precede but, but we were part I think it's interesting we were part of this whole civil rights movement the whole civil rights movement in the late 60s, in the middle 60s, in the late 60s. And one of the things that distinguished the Chicano part or Mexican-American movement during that period, because it wasn't, it wasn't, it was part of a long line of uh, involvement by Mexican-Americans. But in this case, the focus was on higher education. And it, so I think that that probably... Part of the consequence was the GI Bill because a lot of people had uh, come from uh, uh, out of uh, World War II in Korea and they were back in school and there was now more recognition that where that there was people were not <laughs> were not going to school. The enrollment, for example, at the major at the UCLA where I was. Uh, was close to 30,000 students, and there were fewer than 200 uh, Spanish surname students, which means that there were, <laughs> when we saw one another in campus, right. we took uh, notes. We took no. We got to know one another <laughs> yes. right away. Right. Yeah. Uh, a quick bonding. Uh, and what was um, the struggle for you? What, what, you know, where did the battle begin for you to really make this happen, to be a part of this movement? How, how did you come into it? Well, uh, basically academically, the focus was uh, 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 an academic focus. And one of the things that we really believed strongly that we had to do a number of things. First of all, we had to increase enrollment. We had to, have, uh, we had to if you will, begin to admit... Uh, the, the the intelligent students who were being who were being ignored because of their color and because of their ethnicity and uh, so that was one of the one of the primary focus that we had and uh, um, to some extent uh, we saw we had some rewards early on we, there was a lot of cooperation the mood in higher education was one at the time of change. People in higher education recognized that they had not been responsible in the way they behaved. Uh, you know, those, this was a, an era when... At, when what you, year was this? Well, this was in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s. This was, there were still a lot of schools that required a photograph when, when, in case you tried to sneak in and uh, you didn't look right. So uh, somebody whose name was O'Neill, for example, might be... Uh, a black person, right? And but if you had a photograph, well, they'd know that because there, there at the UCLA campus at the time when I was there, the total of non-white enrollment was under a thousand, well under a thousand, more like six. Wow, it's not so long ago. And when, do, uh, 
your son has picked up the mantle. Uh, Ron Lopez teaches uh, ethnic studies, teaches at Sonoma State University. Do you remember when this dialogue began between you and your father? Well, I think I think that if I had not, uh, if my father had involved me as a child, I think I'd probably not be doing it. Uh, so I was very, he very graciously shielded me from you know, some of the politics, but I was still around it. And so I still was exposed to this environment. But more importantly than that, uh, we lived in a neighborhood that was largely white. And so I was exposed to the racism that created a lot of anxiety for me. And I had to, you know, deal with that on my own terms, as all children do. Uh, and it was coming to understand that. Uh, why was it that we were being te taught the history that we were being taught in schools? Uh, why was it that uh, the history that I heard in the classroom? And then I would go home and I would talk to my parents or my grandparents, and especially my grandparents who had been through the World War II experience and, and the labor experience. They would tell me other stories, and I'd be like, wait a minute, that wasn't in the book. And so I started to put those things together and say, I want to learn more about this and become part of the solution to that exclusion of information, that censorship, really. Was it important for you to, for your son, uh, as much as possible, to understand what you were doing as soon as it was possible to explain it to him? Was that well, a part of what you were you're thinking? Well, uh, or were you yeah, just uh, worried I, about it? Well, <laughs> I, I assumed, I assumed that he would find what he, whatever level was more com most comfortable for him i didn't want to direct him to to get into it i mean i wanted him to do something that would satisfy him and that he would enjoy and all that he was exposed because we had uh, our household was always filled with uh, uh scholars and uh, uh actually from a very young age ron actually went when he was six years old to uh uh to a summer institute we had at Stanford for Mexican American Studies, and he got to play with uh, uh, Octavio Romano mm -hmm. <laughs> in uh, the hallways. So, and and at that institute there were a good many people. Rudy Acuna. There were there was there were a lot of people at that institute from all over the Southwest. Uh, Jose Angel Gutierrez. We. And we, 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 uh, uh, it was a six week institute and the whole idea was to coordinate, to, to give more impetus to the area. And it was in, in part, uh, something like, uh, of a follow up to the Plan de Santa Barbara, where we had initially initiated the, uh, the whole idea of Mexican American studies. You're listening to Flashpoints on Pacifica Radio. Uh, we have the privilege of uh, broadcasting from Sebastopol, from the community center here. Uh, there's a benefit tonight with Dr. Loco's Rock and Alabeno band. Dr. Loco is around the table uh, with an old friend of his. Uh, this is a dialogue, by the way. Uh, we're calling it Three Generations of Ethnic Studies. And uh, we have another professor here, Francisco Vasquez who was in this battle uh, from the beginning and uh, well how did you two meet Dr. Loco and Professor in terms of teaching Ron actually was recruited and hired me to go teach at the Claremont Colleges I went to UCLA in 1969 after completing my BA in Anthropology at Cal State Long Beach and was recruited to UCLA to do graduate studies in Anthropology at UCLA and when I got to UCLA uh, I recognized Ron Lopez as a Mexican American, <laughs> and uh, my, and I gravitated because that's why I was there. And there was a cadre of young scholars, graduate students, really interested in developing Chicano studies in lots of ways, connecting with one another and connecting with scholars elsewhere. Because we were trying to figure out how we're going to put this together, whether we're going to attack the disciplines by discipline where we had anthropologists within anthropology and sociologists within sociology, and that was our initial strategy. Uh, we're trying to work within the disciplines, and then we soon realized by 1970-71 that it was not going to work, that we had to form our own organization. And so in that context, you know, we, were, we began to evolve and develop in relationship to one another at UCLA, which was a very important kind of uh, center for thinking about Chicano studies and Berkeley was another center, Texas was another center, and we had these different countries working and developing uh, that evolved into Association of Chicano Studies, first Chicano Scholars in 1971, formed in Las Vegas uh, after meeting in 1970 in San Antonio. 
uh, for the Southwest Association, uh, Social Science Association. We met there and then we decided we needed to form our own organization. We formed it in Las Vegas in 1971 and that transferred into the National Association of Chicano Chicano Studies, that is the organization now. So over the years, it was this kind of evolution of our generation and the next generation of scholars, Francisco, Ronnie, etc., and others that have continued and expanded this notion. And, and uh, Professor Vasquez, why don't you just jump in here and maybe just to throw into the conversation, uh, it's a big battle right now. Uh, there's an attempt to ban ethnic studies at the public school level in Arizona. There's a lot of racism, you know. In that context, uh, what does this all mean? Well, I, you know, I just came back from the uh, meeting of the National Association for Chicano and Chicano Studies in Pasadena. And um, uh, some of the things, and, and also a reunion of our, our group from Claremont from uh, 1968, uh, which we were the first class of uh, people of color to be admitted into the Claremont Colleges. Um, and... Um, it's very clear to me what I told them uh, at the reunion and, and uh, at the association to, to my friends is that as an individual, I, I, I owe a great, a great debt to, um, to Chicano studies because it really connected me with uh, uh, a history of my family that uh, had really been forgotten. Uh, my family was repatriated in the 1930s, along with a million and a half other Mexicans that were blamed for the Depression. And uh, so, you know, there are echoes of what's going on in Arizona uh, today. Every time that there's a, an economic depression, the Mexicans are the number one scapegoat. Um, so when I came uh, from Mexico, the, after many, many comings and goings, and we finally settled, um, it was in, in 1964, then I did high school, then I went to the Claremont Colleges, but I was still very much of a Mexican national and had no no memory of, of the roots that my uh, my grandparents had had here in the United States. So Chicano Studies rec reconnected me with um, uh, something that actually uh, my father had introduced me to the labor struggle uh, back in Guadalajara in Mexico, and I was able to put all these different um, uh, currents of history as they pertain to my life together, and it made me... Um, very active in the community and more importantly have compassion uh, for other people as opposed to just trying to make it uh, as an individual trying to make it on your own you know the, the Horatio Alger you know kind of myth. Um, so I think that uh, the, the term has been used um, uh, by Roberto Rodriguez in Arizona that, that this is a, a cultural genocide and, and I think that uh, for many many years there has been an effort to erase the identity of, of, of the Mexican-American. Um, I think uh, somebody wrote a, a dissertation at USC on how to get Mexicans to stop eating beans and tortillas and eat ham and eggs instead as a way of making them real Americans. You know, this goes back to the 1930s. So th this is really nothing new, but uh, m the only silver lining that I see is that the Mexican community in the United States, the Mexican-American, the Chicano community, has always come back very strongly in asserting their own human rights, uh, because it's not really just cultural rights, it's human rights, and, and I'm, I'm expecting that there will be a very strong organization and a, 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 a backlash against this in Arizona. This is Dennis Burns, and I'm here with our regular Friday producer of Flashpoints, Flashpoints in Espanol, Miguel Gavila Molina, who uh, came out of uh, the next generation of ethnic studies. Where uh, we're sitting, Miguel, in your homeland, uh, where uh, your family uh, worked in the fields. Uh, there's a lot of history uh, that turned into part of your education. Uh, I wanted to turn it over to you. Well, it's true, Dennis. Um, if it hadn't been for Chicano studies, I probably would have not survived uh, college. Uh, you know, it was right where, you know, I entered El Colegio in college just as the Vietnam War uh, was wrapping up. And uh, it was uh, Mecha students that actually recruited me. And once I was there, in the beginning, it frightened me because I went to Sonoma State. Uh, it looked like a prison. And I look around, I had no windows, and I said, oh my, what's, what's happening here? I go, this place is built. To ready to turn into a prison, you know, if they were wanted to lock us down. So that made me nervous, and the whole place was gray. Every every building was gray. But I I, I went to a uh, thing called the Brown Bag Lunch, and uh, 
Brown, was on Brown, was I went, that the Mechistas, uh, the Mecha group there had uh, put on. And, uh, wow. I think it was probably one of the first few times that I ever saw more than one teacher that was Latino, Chicano, or Mexican. And uh, it was it was just empowering for me. And I looked at these professors, I said, hey, in four or five years, I could be that. I could be there, you know. And uh, everybody was real. There was a sense of uh, familia, you know. There was a kind of like compadre, camaradas, you know. There's this feeling of, you know, brother, sisterhood. And it's something that, you know, came out of the colonias, out of the barrios, you know, and it spilled into the school amongst the raza, amongst the Latinos, you know, whether teachers or students. And that was really, uh, for me, uh, what saved my, you know, education. Uh, but to sit here today and to be in front of los, uh, basically the pioneers, uh, those before us that, you know, had to go up against. I know El Mayor Lopez, I mean, you had some battles, hombre. Uh, you know, and I think, I mean, what we hear in the barrio, in the streets, you know, in the back rooms, yeah, man, ese vato, he threw down. Uh, even told him, you know what, you have to take me out of here in the box before I stop teaching. I mean, these are the things we heard. So it really, like, to back up these teachers, we have to back up these professors, because they're struggling too. You know, even when I was going to Sonoma State towards the end of it, back in 76, 77, I know they were trying to eliminate ethnic studies and turn it, and trying to eliminate Chicano studies and turn it into Latin American studies, where you might get one class or maybe two, rather than the whole department, you know, of the discipline. And those battles raged on, and some of them, in a lot of places, we lost. We lost ethnic studies, you know, or Chicano studies disappeared. But here, in other places, you know, they're still, you know, very much active, uh, of course, with cutbacks, it's decimated, you know, Chicano studies across the board. How many times were you beaten up in the so-called regular school system? Well, what, you know, you're talking about being in college and sort of the beginning of ethics, but what, was, what did it take to just get there? Well, I mean, when I started school back in the, you know, late 50s, uh, when I tell people, you know, I learned Spanish, agarrotes, you know, I learned Spanish by getting it beat into me. Uh, those days, you know, corporal punishment was a way of discipline. And uh, I was considered, you know, uh, mentally incapacitated or mentally challenged today. But back then, I was considered mentally retarded. And I got put in the, in the special ed class, which, you know, I looked around, híjole. You know, I can talk. There's nothing wrong with me. There was a lot of disabilities, a lot of, you know, issues there, you know, mental, you know, issues and so forth. Uh, my only problem is I didn't speak English. I didn't understand English. So to them, I was a pendejo. But, uh, I mean, I knew, but every day, most frightening experience was the reading circles. I hated the reading circles. Because in the reading circles, the teacher made you go around in the circle and everybody read a page. For every word mispronounced or not said correctly, you got a, you got your hand beat by a you know a yardstick. So for me, every day, you know, it was fifty to sixty, you know, slaps in the hand. By the end of a session, my hands were red. They were red, swollen, and burning. And of course, I wanted to cry. I'm a kid. I wanted to cry, but I wasn't going to let them see me cry. Uh, and that's kind of like pushed me. Uh, you know, just push me. I mean, and then in high school, they threw all of us, you know, everybody that's brown, boom, in the auto shop. Well, I didn't want to be an auto mechanic. I didn't want to be a chango. I said, I don't want to be a grease monkey. You know, I wanted to get into electronics, but I wasn't smart enough, according to them. Well, then they threw me in the wood shop, and in wood shop, I, I didn't want to be a wood shop. I don't want to be a carpintero. I don't want to chop wood. I don't want to be a wood maker. You know, I want to, I want to get in electronics. Pues, uh, in that wood shop, you know, they threw me out because I made my first project. I made a billy club. Protection, security. You know, I was always getting beat on, so, you know, arrote. And uh, then they dropped me out, and finally I ended up in electronics. And I built my first crystal radio unit. And it blew the teacher away because, you know, they let me because there was no other place to put me. And that's what inspired me to get into radio, into media, and then from high school, you know, the opportunidad to get into college and into Chicano studies. And here I am today, faced by the mayores, what I call the war horses of Chicano studies. And, and let me ask the teachers, uh, I mean, because this is about, uh, the thing that's extraordinary when you look at what's going on in Arizona now, is how incredibly successful the programs have been keeping kids in school.
making sure that they go to college. The incredible self-image that comes out of these courses. These kids are really very young at a very at an elementary school age. These kids are fighting for these courses because of the depth of their meaning. And that is, I guess, I, I'd like you to respond to that. And that's what, for me, is goes to the core of the racism, that they see it working. And because it works, they want to kill it. It should be really, the Arizona public school system should be a model, I think, for the rest of the country. Well, there's one thing that <coughs> people yes. ignore. Ron Lucas. Uh, yeah. Um, that the normal, when we were in, introducing... Uh, Mexican American studies. One of the one of the responses was, "Why not integrate it into the regular curriculum?" And what you have to do, I believe, if you stand back and look at the regular curriculum, so-called regular curriculum, uh, you'll see that that also is ethnic studies. It's just not defined as such. So that, for example, a common class that people take is uh, Western civilization. What's Western civilization about? It's about Western Europe. Now, if you think about it, you try to be a little practical, you get all of Western Europe from, from uh, England to France, Germany, Italy, all, all, Spain, all of those places, and you draw, draw it on a map, and you could put that all in California. What? I'm sorry. How is that? Universal, when it's local, it's a, and it's and and not only that, all the Western Euro, Euro, Europeans are essentially related. They're all from similar tribes. So, though, so so theirs theirs is ethnic study. That is ethnic studies as well. And and partly, you know, when you grow up in in uh, in a society like the United States and if you're not part of the majority society then you there are a lot of things you don't get for example i didn't know about uh, uh nursery rhymes i didn't hear nursery rhymes when I, when I was growing up i i didn't know who winnie the pooh was until later on in life i mean you know on and babar what's that See, all of those things, we, they're, they're incidentals, they're, they're harmless and all that, but they're also part of the composite makeup of society. And because there's a certain amount of cultural uniformity, and that cultural uniformity can be, too often can be exclusive, and exclusive meaning it excludes. And, and oh, I'm Wait. sorry. Okay, the um, another thing is that, when kids come in and they take these tests, since they don't know that information, uh, since the school system does not build on the assets that they bring in from their own culture, whether it's Mexican culture or some other culture, they don't have any of those assets. They actually end up with less when they get out of school. There's a, a, an idea called subtractive schooling, and there's a great book about that by Angela Valenzuela. But this idea is that you take a kid and he speaks Spanish beautifully and he maybe reads in Spanish even and he has knowledge that's in, he learned in Spanish. But now you're going to say, well, none of that matters. None of that, but your parents don't matter. Anything they've taught you don't matter. Well, that creates rebelliousness. Now, people, now the guy, the kid says, well, I don't know what, nothing that I have already that comes from my familia is good. Then, um, you know, there's two routes. Either I reject everything you tell me or I reject myself. And neither one of those leads to success. And part of the idea of Chicano studies and ethnic studies is we want to not only build that up for the, the kids that are so-called minority kids, but not for long, uh, but we want to also inform other members of the community about the richness that our cultures have so they can benefit from them too. And we have a lot of white students and African-American students and Asian-American students in our Chicano and Latino studies classes. Well, I just want to say, Jose Clayton here. And I want to kind of focus, direct you to kind of another attention just to bring it a different perspective on it. Because I just uh, retired uh, from the only college of ethnic studies in the world at San Francisco State. And as they cut back around San Francisco State, we have made had some losses in the College of Ethnic Studies, but we've maintained the college. They're cutting other colleges, but not ethnic studies. 
One of the things that we need to look around and think about in terms of the decisions we made in the past regarding Chicano studies, ethnic studies, uh, black studies, in terms of now looking at what has survived, what has thrived, which programs have PhDs, which programs have grown and which have not. We can begin to see, for example, compare UC Berkeley with UC Santa Barbara, San Francisco State with Sonoma State or uh, Northridge with Cal State LA, et cetera, in, in private schools with public schools to begin to see, well, where is ethnic studies thriving and what are the circumstances and conditions that even in these difficult times uh, have led to those to survive and what is happening to those that were under attack and that have been under attack and I think that's I mean although I don't have the answer to that question I think we need to begin to really look and see who's doing what and who's surviving and who's not and how do we strengthen those programs by beginning to emulate those that have survived in the hard times and are growing even under the circumstances Professor Vest. I think that um the the uh, ethnic struggles in Arizona are really hiding um, a major uh, problem um, that's um, not only nationwide but all over the world, and it's really the class struggle. And uh, I think you know one of the uh, things that you learn in Chicano studies, and I remember very clearly from a, a professor, also one of the veteranos, Mario Barrera. Um, in his class saying, you know, we need to study the barrio and we need to study it from all the different disciplines, but we also need to learn about international relations because if there's a nuclear war, we're all going to get wiped out. You know, the barrio is going to get wiped out. So, you know, so we, a, a group of us within ethnic studies, within Chicano studies, focused on um, the material conditions that, that inform, you know, the struggle. And, um, when when you're um, when you're raised in such a way where you're not learning, or, or like uh, Ron Lopez uh, El Hijo uh, said, when you don't understand what um, uh, who you are, what's your identity, um, it, it really affects your ability to to survive intellectually in so many different ways. I think one of the, the things that helped me is that I had a very strong Mexican identity. And then I learned to, through college and through the Chicano movement what it was to be a Chicano. And one of them was to be proud of being working class and to learn about the working class struggle. And I think that as, as we move into a neo-fascist kind of government in the United States where we can have elections and we can have respect for the Constitution and still have a neo-fascist government, the only way that we can really fight against that is to develop a very strong working class movement. And I think that's part of Chicano studies, and I think that that's one of the reasons why it's also under attack. But we need to, we need to differentiate, as Ron Lopez was saying, we have had white ethnic studies for a long, long time. And now we, we're talking about uh, people of color ethnic studies. And, but, but we can't forget that, that hidden within those cultural wars is really a, a, a class war, a class struggle. And this is clearly a cultural war. This is the targeting of Mexican-American studies in Arizona. Uh, and they are very serious. The ban, I believe, if, if they do not stop teaching in the public school system, uh, the, these courses by April 18th, they will have major cuts at the, at the state level to their budgets. They will be, this is punitive. And it, so it thus does really feel like uh, an ethnic cleansing. I mean, it, it really is quite overt. Uh, I guess I shouldn't be well, shocked. Right? Well, you know, <laughs> well, but part, part of yes, the, I think part of, part of the movement that, uh, what's his name, uh, Thorn, Tom Thorn in the butt. Um. <laughs> uh, it's Thorn, uh, yeah. right? But what? what, yeah. what he, he clearly, clearly is not a, a very, very thoughtful. He's the current he, attorney general of Arizona, yeah. formerly uh, school board. He was, he was a yeah. school, I think, superintendent. He was, he, yeah, and then something. he went to. Yeah. But he, but, but that, that, that whole idea, and I think that. Uh, Francisco has pointed something out that's very important because part of the neocon impetus that's currently uh, now 
um, um, being manifest through a wide variety of, of uh, conservative a a activities is really a class war that they're waging. I mean, what? who are they trying to punish? They're not just trying to punish Mexican Americans and Mexicans. They're also trying to punish poor people, old people, trying to punish women. They're trying to punish anybody who they believe is not, who, who does not have a strong political voice. And, and even though women constitute, should actually be the strongest voice in our society because, because of the various factors, they're not, right? And so, this there this attack that's going on right now is a multifaceted attack it has from my perspective as an older guy it it's like people they're too, they want us to go backwards they want us to go back 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 to where there were a handful of rich people and a whole lot of poor people and when the, the academy had a different perspective, I mean, the one thing that et, that ethnic studies brings at the high school level, the junior in Arizona, the one thing we bring is a different paradigm. They may have had ethnic studies in a long time, but the difference that we made when we came in is we brought in a critical perspective, critiquing the dominant as opposed to the victim. Uh, we brought a perspective that said we need to be multi-theoretical, multi-methodological in order to uh, analyze the issues that are addressing our community. We have to be community-centered as opposed to academy-centered. Mm -hmm. Our concern is with the needs of the community, not with the needs of the academy. And fourthly, the one thing that I like to underscore that ethnic studies brings in its characteristics when we look at ethnic studies literature is that we bring in the reflexive dimension. Whereas in the dominant scholars, the pretense is to be objective, to have no biases when they come do research in our community and when they reach conclusions about our community and the proposed policy about our community, we propose to be subjective. We propose that we are biased and we understand that we put our biases forth. If we are oriented in supporting the working class, we make that clear. If we're supportive in attacking the dominant white supremacist perspectives, we make that clear so that our students and everyone understands what our objectives are, what our origins are, where we come from, and what those origins bring and bias, how that affects our work, instead of trying to pretend to be objective, as they have been pretending for many years when they do the research. And in that, we put ourselves in the thick of the action, as C. Wright Mills said, and we took that from C. Wright Mills, where we speak from the first person as opposed to the third person. We don't talk about them in the community. We talk about our community and our role in our community and our role in our research. And I think that's what threatens them. I think the very nature of empowering people to speak for themselves, the very nature of saying we have to be multi-methodological and multi-theoretical, and the very fact that we say we are community first, not academy first, and that we critique the dominant, not the dominated, I think is a threat. And that's what ultimately I think threatens the dominance. That was the voice of uh, Dr. Loco, a.k.a. Uh, it, but one of the things that comes across, you know, from hearing this conversation is that, uh, is that the system itself is attempting to erase, not just eliminate, you know, ethnic studies and Chicano studies, but to erase the memories. You know, completely erase the memories as if we never existed. Hmm. You know, I mean, that's what we see, you know, on the ground level. Um, and that battle is raging. I mean, I was just at a rally uh, this past uh, Monday for domestic workers up in Sacramento. And uh, while we were wrapping up our actions rally, uh, the uh, Tom Donnelly, I believe, from uh, Southern California, legislator, uh, invited Russell Pierce, the author of SB 1070, to be the keynote speaker at this rally in Sacramento. Well, their turnout was pathetic, but it's also very unnerving because we can't not take it for granted. I mean, that's how they started their movement there in Arizona, you know, by first, you know, instituting the law, you know, attacking workers, you know, whether immigrant or not, they still are the workers. And once they, that settled and it became law, well, it's still, of course, you know, some of the parts of it are still up for debate, you know, in the Supreme Court. But, you know, it's still, that climate is still a law. And once they got secured in that, then they went after our education.
And in Arizona, you know, we're looking at it as, you know, Chicano studies, but in reality, it's all ethnic studies. It's just not Mexican-American studies. It's also African-American studies, Asian studies. And we really have to be vigilant here in California because we cannot take it for granted that, hey, you know, it'll never pass here. I kept, throughout the week, I heard, oh, it'll never happen here in California. I said, whoa, don't you, matter, don't you remember Pete, oh, excuse me, Pete Wilson? 187, don't you all remember that? They passed here in California, and it got ruled unconstitutional. So here we are, you know, in these dynamics and having these conversations. Well, we have to take it outside of, you know, our circles and organize the community and, and the youth who want and demand Chicano studies. Oh, thank you very much, <clears throat> Gavilan. I want to uh, mention that the, um, the law itself is called SB 2281. And it was pushed through, actually, originally and passed through the uh, uh, Arizona legislature and was uh, vetoed by Napolitano. But then Napolitano became part of the uh, Obama administration. As a consequence, it was reintroduced and made stronger than it had been before. And that's how it is now. So I was just at the most recent, uh, along with Dr. Vasquez, uh, Chicano and Latino Studies Conference, Knox Conference, and um, we saw the film Precious Knowledge, which I want to put in a plug for. It's a film about that. And it's out in uh, film festivals right now. It's not yet in general release, but you can look it up. Precious Knowledge. So look for that, folks. It's a, it's a great film. And if you find out and if you need information, we can probably... I, I have the information. My name is Ron Lopez, professor of Sonoma State University, Chicago Studies, uh, to... Um, uh, about fundraising, because now the, the teachers' union uh, is raising money for the appeal. All right. Uh, I want to thank all of you. Uh, Ron Lopez, Sr., uh, Ron Lopez, just speaking, uh, professor, ethnic studies, uh, Chicano studies at Sonoma State University. Uh, we appreciate your press. Uh, professor Francisco Vasquez, always incredibly enlightening and very moving. And Dr. Loco, well, let me remind everybody, we are here uh, at uh, the sub Bastopol Community Center, it's a benefit for the uh, Great and Day Labor Center. These day labor centers are on the front line. This is where the front line of the new civil rights movement is. It's fighting for the rights of these workers who do the hardest work and get beaten and arrested for doing it. We want to talk about, uh, and maybe, Ron, you can stay around a little bit, and uh, we want to talk about uh, uh, 10 years of fighting here uh, at the uh, uh, day labor uh, uh, center, uh, why these people are fighting so hard. We're going to go ask Dr. Local and Francisco uh, Molina, to uh, give us a little uh, musical break and then we're going to come back and talk about uh, what this benefit here is about tonight and uh, why you should all be crowding on in to hear some extraordinary music and uh, share the great culture, uh, the dance, the music. So here's some music though. <laughs>
um, with so many generations of <coughs> promoters. I myself was a Latin American studies major and growing up um, in this area and being white, I did not get very much information about um, other cultures.